right, well, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening for the Winooski Main Street Revitalization Construction Public Meeting. Um, before we jump right into it, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items. So this meeting will be recorded um, by CCTV, and it will be posted to the project website and also shared to our email distribution list. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. Um, remote attendees, you are going to be muted throughout the presentation, um, but when we get to the Q&A section at the end of the presentation, mm -hmm. you will have the ability to unmute. Um, to do this, you just need to raise your hand and then we'll kind of unmute you as we go. If you are joining us by phone um, to raise your hand, you're just going to hit star nine and then you'll be able to unmute using star six. Um, we'll also have a Q&A um, on the screen for people that are attending through their computer. Um, if you don't feel comfortable unmuting, you can also enter questions um, through the Q&A section and we'll read them out loud for you. Um, and then just in person, normal thing, just raise your hand and I'll come and run you over a mic and we will answer questions that way. So we're just going to alternate between the room and the people online to make sure everybody's voices are heard this evening and welcome again to this meeting. A uh, couple things for people online, um, if you're joining us from a computer, there's a couple features kind of up on the top screen just to change the way that you're viewing. Um, and then also your mute and unmute is down here. Um, we've got our chat and Q&A and then our raise hand feature just down here along that bottom bar. Um, so that's how you're gonna be able to talk to us during that Q&A section. So I am gonna go ahead and hand it off to Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. So I'm gonna jump right into it. My name is Ryan Lambert, I'm city engineer for Winooski. Lot of material to cover tonight. It's, it's high level, it's general, but we don't want to leave anything out. Um, so we've set it up that we'll go through some project background to start, get into the construction schedule, talk about the impacts that folks can expect during construction, cover our methods of communicating information to the public during construction, and we'll close with a Q&A session. Um, two things I'll note, one, please hold questions until the end of the presentation, and two, this is really a construction specific meeting, um, so if we can keep the questions on topic, we're most equipped to address questions specific to construction. If there are other questions about the design or other facets of the project, happy to answer those um, after the meeting. <coughs> So on the screen, you'll see a, a map of the project area outlined in pink. It's uh, about eight tenths of Main Street, which is also US Route 2 and 7. The northern end is the town line shared with Colchester, and it extends to the southern, the southern end, uh, which is the overpass uh, at the railroad tracks. So as mentioned, eight tenths of a mile, including some of the extents up and down the side streets that intersect with Main Street. The purpose of the project is to improve the safety, accessibility, and mobility for all modes of transportation, replace and upgrade utilities and public infrastructure, and maintain a critical regional connection. And this third bullet is very relevant to the construction phase. There's all this work that we need to do, but we cannot interrupt the traffic traveling through the corridor, and we're not interrupting utilities to folks for 99.9% .9 of the project. So we'll get into the details on that. The project team consists of the city of Winooski as the owner. We have a joint effort, Uberkey and Joint Align companies are the contractor that will be doing the work. These are two companies that are uh, part of the same parent company, DA Collins, out of upstate New York. Um, recently, they completed a B-Trans project in Winooski, the class one highway resurfacing on Route 15 East Allen Street. So they are familiar with the area and they do work up in northern Vermont. On the design side on this third row, we have VHB as the prime consultant. Dufresne Group is covering the water and sewer side of design. LM Consulting on the electrical and telecom. And then we have GPI representing the resident engineer performing the inspection work on behalf of the city during construction. Uh, the fourth row we're listing fund various funding agencies. We've been fortunate to gather a, a sizable amount of funding from uh, various sources to support this project. These include the USDA Rural Development, uh, the 
SRF funding programs for clean water and drinking water, which is an EPA fund that's managed by Vermont DEC. We also have funding from Northern Border Regional Commission and U.S. Forest Service. And down at the bottom, uh, we know VTRANS and WSP. VTRANS has been a valuable partner through the project. They're not a direct funder of anything specific to the project, but they have extended their contract with WSP. Um, they're doing public outreach efforts for a nearby project, which I'll mention in a moment, and they've extended that public outreach um, services to the city for this project. So we're very grateful for all the funding and the efforts by VTrans and WSP. The scope of work for the project is really a complete overhaul of all the infrastructure in the right of way. So all the utilities are being replaced, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater. The electrical and telecoms currently on poles through the corridor are being moved underground and there's a natural gas line being relocated and replaced. <clears throat> Um, above ground, we're replacing, reconstructing the roadway. The curbings are being rebuilt. Those will be moved four feet in on both sides. So that'll allow for wider sidewalk space and an amenity belt with trees and street lights, uh, new sidewalks, new signals, new signage. Um, so it's really a complete overhaul of the road. There will be a uphill climbing bike lane with a buffer on the uphill side, the east side of the road. Um, there's a reduction in street parking, but this cross-section um, will vary somewhat depending on where you're located in the corridor. There'll be street parking alternating on both sides, depending on where you are. Um, again, if you're interested in design, uh, happy to answer questions after this meeting at some point. We do have the plans posted on the project website if you are interested in getting into the details on that. This graphic shows the timeline of the project development. Um, some scoping did begin in 2017, and there was a bond vote passed by the city that allowed for this project to move forward in May of 2018. So we're, started, we're showing the uh, preliminary plan starting summer of 2018, moving all the way through final design right away, uh, bid advertisement, contract award, and now we're here in construction, spring of 2024. Um, I will note that, you know, we did, hope to move the design a little bit faster, but uh, get to construction sooner. Uh, there was a lot of complexities associated with the um, utility coordination and undergrounding the overhead utilities paired with the right-of-way efforts. Um, all the electrical equipment is being located on private property. So without getting into the details on that, you know, we're here now and we're very excited to move into construction. So with that, the construction schedule, we have a targeted start date of April 15th and a completion sometime in 2026. So that's three construction seasons, two full seasons, and a third that'll be a partial season. There'll be winter shutdowns between each season. Uh, typical working hours will be Monday through Friday between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. The contract does allow for night and weekend work to happen on a, a you know, as needed basis. There's certain locations, likely the busier intersections, will need to probably do some night work. Um, some of the utility work will need to happen at night to limit uh, negative impacts to businesses and whatnot. But if there is night work, it's typically Sunday nights through Thursday nights between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, any weekend work would be during the day. So those are the, the typical hours. I'm going to get into the sequencing that the contractors put forward. That this is, you know, what we're working off of right at the start. It is subject to change based on progress, um, unanticipated conditions, weather delays, etc. But this is where we're at right now. So to start in 2024, we'll have traffic control measures implemented, uh, erosion protection, sediment control, clearing and grubbing, tree removal. That's all the first step. And then the, the contractors' crews will begin installing the city utilities starting with the sewer on the southern end of the project, so around the Maple Street intersection, and they'll work their way northward. That's projected to wrap up in August. Uh, gas relocation by Vermont Gas will happen concurrently with the sewer work. A separate crew will work on the water infrastructure behind the sewer and work their way northward as well. That is projected to wrap up in September of this year. 
Once the sewer crew is done on the northern end, they'll come back to the southern end and install the stormwater infrastructure. And that's projected to happen between August and November. Some work on the eastern sidewalk will follow. Um, east sidewalk is where the main duck bank is located for the underground utilities. So that will go in. Uh, there's also deeper infrastructure for the, the street trees and the street lights that would be installed. And as they progress forward, they'll put in the concrete sidewalks and repair the driveway aprons. <clears throat> that work will also continue from the southern end to the northern end. Um, some road work will begin in 2024 as well. Full road reconstruction and curbing replacement. Um, the contractor has indicated they hope to get as far as Spring Street. So everything south of Spring Street could be completed within uh, the curb to curb distance. And then, uh, you know, anywhere that's been disturbed within the corridor, they'll put down temporary pavement for the winter shutdown, temporary line striping, and take down the traffic control for the winter shutdown. 2025 and 2026, um, Really just a continuation, they'll pick up again in the spring of 2025, continue with the electrical telecom duct banks. Um, once that's installed, the utilities can begin relocating their overhead lines underground. Uh, the contract will wrap up the remaining sidewalk work, the aprons, the drives, um, landscaping and paver belts will commence. We, they'll, they'll start putting in the street lights, uh, continuing with their foundation, signal foundations, the, the, the street light and signal conduit, and most of the remaining road work and curbing will be installed in 2025. 2026 is, is really come back and wrap up whatever is left at that point, the final touches on the project, um, lighting fixtures, signal equipment, some landscaping, plantings, all the final line striping. Most of this work will be out of the roadway, so this season will be a partial season and um, likely less impactful to the public. So just to clarify, this project is different from two of the other projects that are also in close proximity. VTrans is working on the Exit 16 interchange called the Diverging Diamond Interchange, DDI. That project started last year and it, it has two phases. They completed the first phase in 2023. The second phase will resume next year. So I note that because this project will overlap with the schedule for the Main Street project in 2025. We also have the Winooski Bridge Replacement Project. That is projected to begin construction on or after 2027. That will not overlap with Main Street. Okay, moving on into impacts of construction on the public. I've broken this down into uh, traffic, parking, ingress, egress, utilities, and a, a miscellaneous of impacts that I'd like everyone to be aware of. Starting with traffic, um, under the contract, contractor is preparing a traffic control plan, which maintains traffic flow during construction, allows them to complete the work they need to do without causing um, excessive uh, impacts to folks. With that said, you should expect delays as with any road construction project. Um, and it should be noted, please use caution, be alert when you pass through work zones. It's for your safety and for the worker's safety as well. Uh, in general, the work will be limited to the active work zones, I should say, to two blocks at any time. These will most likely be two continuous blocks. They could be you know, in one location and then a couple blocks elsewhere, but the traffic control will extend north and south of that active work zone. I note this because, you know, there's not going to be a point where the entire eight tenths of a mile of Main Street will be actively under construction. It'll be done in sections. Um, and we're also doing quite a bit of additional coordination with some larger stakeholders on the corridor, particular Winooski School District, the fire department. Green Mountain Transit has bus lines through the corridor, so we're making sure that the traffic control takes into account their particular needs. So a little bit more on the specifics of the traffic control. Um, there will be a few schemes, and the scheme will be specific to where the work is happening. But in general, in each scheme, 
the traffic control will consist of reducing Main Street to one lane for vehicles, northbound only. Southbound traffic will be detoured to Weaver Street. Now Weaver Street will continue to have northbound traffic as well, but this detour will be 24 seven during those particular phases. Um, there'll be impacts to side streets, uh, some sidewalk closures as needed, pedestrian traffic will be maintained through construction. An exception to this is any work north of Tigan Street will keep two lanes, one lane in each direction at all times. We don't have that Weaver Street bypass available there, so we need to maintain that, that traffic for that area. As noted, all traffic control will be removed during the winter shutdowns and replaced in the spring. And it should be clearly indicated by signage out on the road where you need to go during these detours. We'll also have portable changeable message signs up at the entrances to Winooski, possibly at the off ramps um, at exit 16 and exit 15 on the interstate informing folks that may be entering or passing through when you see that there is a large construction project and they may want to consider an alternate route. And finally, any changes or updates to traffic control during construction will have some information going out in our weekly emails, which I'll get into a little bit later. Moving on, parking in general during construction no street parking will be permitted in the work zone during working hours. Now, this is going to be fairly specific to the work at hand, but typically if the work is happening during normal hours, there will be um, permission for parking overnight as needed if there's space available, um, provided you move your car by 7 a.m. The exception to this is for the permanent detour period you know, when we have one lane on, on Main Street, we don't want folks parking in that one lane because we need to keep it wide enough for emergency vehicles to get around if needed. Um, it should be noted too, as, as with traffic, uh, parking updates will be included in the weekly emails that we'll be putting out. And finally, the contractor does reserve the right to tow vehicles. We are going to try to avoid this as much as possible. Um, it, you know, we can get in touch with the owner of the car and we'll ask them to move. But if there's a point where the car is there and the contractor has to get going, then they do reserve the right to, to tow. It may be towed around the corner, but um, they reserve that right. Um, moving on, the, the uh, Weaver Street detour in particular, but really any detour routes, we may also see reduced parking to better allow for the increased capacity of traffic on those detour routes. Um, one location we think is, this is very likely and necessary is the section of Weaver south of Spring Street. Um, most people in town know that it's not really, it, there's parking on both sides and it is challenging for two cars to pass one another. So at a minimum, we'll be reducing parking to one side of the road during uh, any detours that use that stretch of Weaver Street. And then finally, driveways. Um, there's not going to be a point during construction where, uh, in general, where there would be any reason that you can't continue to park on private property in your driveway or in your parking lot. That said, it, some of the work is, is absolutely necessary to do. Um, there's no way to do it without some sort of impact to the driveway. Um, we're going to have a lot of communication and coordination with businesses and residents on a case-by-case -case basis to deal with this, but it needs to be noted that that is one of the impacts to expect during construction. So sort of continuing in that same vein, ingress and egress to properties. At no point will you not be able to enter or leave your property if you're a pedestrian. If you're trying to move your vehicle on or off your property, that's where it gets a little complicated. And there will be times where we just have to close the driveway off or you know, typically it'd be limited to a few hours at most, but during those stretches, you know, we'll notify you uh, ahead of time and you can either keep your car there and just choose not to move your car or you could park it around the corner. Um, it, it's, in my opinion, one of the most challenging 
parts of the project in terms of coordinating with the public to mitigate negative impacts to folks is, is how we deal with shutting down driveways during road projects. Um, in particular, some of the larger buildings on the corridor, the multi-units that have one driveway. Logistically, it, it, it may be too challenging to ask, you know, 30 people to move their car around the corner. Uh, there just might not be enough parking available. So in those cases, you know, we're, we're throwing around ideas as how to deal with that, but likely something like putting down temporary plating um, if there, you know, is, is some work like concrete curing or sidewalk um, that typically we, we want to at least give it 48 hours to cure before cars drive over it and the contractor can put down a plate at the end of the day after it's been poured and the driveway can be reopened for that curing period. Um, so very much a case by case basis. It's going to require a lot of specific targeted coordination with the folks that are at the impacted properties. And you know, for that reason, communication is key. Um, I'll get to it in a moment, but you know, we're, we're really hoping that folks, a, a main takeaway from this is you can sign up for these weekly email notifications because all this information is gonna be relayed in that form and um, I'll continue. <clears throat> okay, impacts to utilities. Uh, just like traffic, utilities will be maintained during construction. Uh, utilities being water, sewer, gas, electric, uh, telephone, cable, internet, all, all of those are utilities. Really, we're, we're maintaining service, but we will need to have scheduled shutoffs. Um, this is necessary whenever we need to isolate the main lines to switch from new to old. When we change services to the specific properties, there'll be a brief shutoff to make that switch over. We will provide advance notice to the impacted properties when this happens. And in particular with businesses, because there are specific you know, needs and we want to avoid any situation that would require a business to close on account of the construction, there would be an additional level of coordination with those folks. If at any point you are having issues with any utility, um, it's not working or it's spotty or there's quality issues uh, and you didn't receive notice, it's possible that was unintentional and was an unscheduled shutoff. Please notify us if that happens so that we can address it as soon as possible. I will get to how you can notify us towards the end of this presentation. Um, getting into the specifics a little bit more. So there's city owned and private utilities. I'll start with the city owned utilities. That's water, sewer, stormwater. You know, as a person who lives or works on the corridor, most of what you'll notice as far as impacts in day to day, um, if there is a shutoff, it would be on the water side. Um, before I get into the details of how we deal with that, uh, I, I want to note temporary water and bypass pumping. I'm not going to get into the details of what exactly that is, but it's, and we can answer questions at the end, but essentially it's necessary to implement these measures to maintain the utility during construction in a situation where the new main is in the same location as the existing and we need to take the existing offline to put in the new main. So temporary water is, is projected to need, be needed between Spring Street and Stephen Street. Bypass pumping, which is you know similar but uses a pump to move your wastewater downstream is, is to be needed between Union and Spring Street. Both of these will happen in June. On the sewer side, you really won't notice any change. On the water side, there's there will be a level of coordination with the property owners to tie in the temp water system to your plumbing. Um, there would be no change to the quality of your water. Depending on your plumbing, there may be a change to water pressure. But once we get into that phase, if you are affected by temp water, you know, we'll have a lot more information for you. With the scheduled shutoffs, there'll be a minimum 24 hour advance notice. This is usually in the form of a door hanger at the minimum. And uh, if you sign up for the emails, we can tap that method of communication to, to give you advance notice as well. When there are shutoffs, it's not necessarily limited to just Main Street, uh, especially when we need to isolate sections of the main line to, to reconnect. The 
shut up area could extend all the way down to the end of the um, side streets. So just be aware, you'll still be notified, but just because you don't live on Main Street doesn't mean you might not be impacted by this work. Uh, for residential properties, we'll typically try to do the connections for the service replacements between 9 and 3 a.m., uh, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., excuse me. And the shutoff, you know, is typically done well, you know, within that window. Uh, we do recommend folks that, are, that would be home during those shutoffs to fill containers for use um, for cooking, drinking, flushing the toilet, that sort of thing. It's, it's uh, just a good thing to have. Uh, for commercial residences, obviously that's not gonna cut it. There's more specific needs. They need running water to stay open. So that's, uh, that varies a little bit. It requires some more coordination. Likely a lot of that will need to happen at night. But again, case by case basis, and we're gonna coordinate directly with you. Um, I'll note too, the service pipe work generally replaced just within the public right away for both water and sewer. If you're a property owner and you're interested in replacing the rest of your line, which you own, you own from the curb stop valve to your building on the water side, and you own from a new clean out to your building on the sewer side, we do encourage you to consider uh, hiring a third party to replace that line. And if you're interested, please reach out after this meeting and we can provide some more information on that. On the private utility side, so gas, electricity, telephone, cable, communications, these actual replacements will be done by the utility provider. Um, in terms of the scheduled shutoffs, you can expect a lot of the same as with the city utilities. There's just a, an additional level of coordination between a third party, being the utility, and the city and the, um, our contractor. So, it's, it's similar in terms of uh, advance notice and how long the shutoff would need to take, but um, just a little extra layer of complication. Um, same level of coordination with businesses should be expected for all this. And um, I'll note too that with these, the service lines extend up to the building. So, you know, the, the trenches that would cut into private property will all be restored um, to match the pre-existing condition. Just wrapping up on impact, some, some miscellaneous items that I feel the public should be aware of. Construction noise is an obvious one. You know, especially if it's at night, there will be efforts to mitigate that to the extent possible, but it's road construction, there's power tools, equipment, it's gonna be a little loud at times. Um, we're not expecting a lot of bedrock excavation here, but uh, it is possible, especially around the Stevens Street intersection, we may have some rock removal needed. Um, that presents its own challenges, and you know, if, if we need to do that, we'll get into um, what those impacts might be you know, at that time and, and it, uh, issue additional notice to folks. Um, erosion protection and sediment control, you know, it's a priority to keep our waterways clear, so we're gonna take all necessary measures to keep sediment from ending up in our storm system and into the river. Dust control is another one that, that's, uh, that can be a pretty big nuisance for folks. Um, the contractor can put down a, you know, a basically calcium chloride solution to keep the dust at, um, under control during the, the drier weather. Um, if you are feeling like that is not being done adequately, please let us know. And lastly, soil management plan. So this is with regard to contaminated soils. Um, there have been and are still a number of gas stations along the corridor. So we are aware of uh, some contamination plumes that, that we're gonna deal with. The soil management plan is, is how we're gonna deal with that. And it basically requires us, our contractor, to follow all you know, applicable regulations so that we can protect the public from any sort of negative impacts of that contamination and prevent that contamination from spreading beyond those plumes. Um, so you know, any excess soil be disposed of accordingly in a legal fashion. Okay, so wrapping up with communication, um, you know, the outreach efforts, we're trying to get this information out to the public. This is, you know, a major project for the city of Winooski and it's gonna have significant impacts and we want people to be aware of those impacts. And you know, this meeting tonight is part of that effort. But going through some of the other um, media that you know we have 
been broadcasting information. We have a, a project website, windowsdbt.gov slash Main Street. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested, the project plans are up there. There's also a, a lot of other information available. So check that out. Um, email notifications. These will consist of, of weekly updates. If you did sign up um, for the East Allen resurfacing work, um, those were extremely helpful to sort of understand where the work was going to occur the following week, what the traffic uh, impacts and parking impacts you can expect. Um, so definitely recommend signing up for those you know, as soon as you can and, and get those weekly emails. There'll also be emails as needed um, beyond a weekly basis in case there's a, a change midweek um, that folks need to know about. And then, you know, if we have your contact info and we know your, your address, we can use your email for uh, notifying of other impacts related to your property, so their driveway and utilities. Door-to-door -door outreach, uh, WSP has been out, maybe you've seen them, they've, they've gone door-to-door -to, -door to deliver some materials, talk with business owners about the project, so that's happened already. And then during construction, um, the contractor will be putting door hangers out quite often to notify folks of um, these impacts in it ahead of time. We'll also have some monthly multilingual updates in audio and video format for folks that may not be fluent in English. We don't want to leave anybody out of this, this uh, public outreach effort. Uh, we'll have informational prints that includes fact sheets, posters, and a brochure. Some of that's available tonight, so please grab one. And then finally, we are supporting a, uh, you know, we're open for business campaign that's, that's mostly being managed by the Downtown Winooski Association, but we, we're supporting it and, you know, posting signage at the ends of the Main Street corridor. We want folks to, you know, continue to go to the restaurants, go shopping at the stores on Main Street, you know, keep supporting the businesses. This is a two and a half year construction project and you know, there's no doubt that there is some negative um, impacts associated with road construction to businesses. So we're trying to mitigate that to the greatest extent possible. Um, you know, we're, we're copying a bit of what Burlington's been doing in their Main Street project if, um, if you've been down there recently. Okay, public inquiries. Um, uh, we've got a contact info up on the screen right now, 24-hour hotline for phone calls and email, info at winooskimainstreet.com. Uh, we've set it up so that everybody and anybody, all stakeholders can call these, this number or send an email to this address. It'll go to WSP. WSP will relay depending on who the best party is to receive that message to either the city, the contractor, or the engineer. And we will get back to you as soon as possible and try to address whatever the, the concern is. So in closing, um, we have a QR code. If you have a smartphone, you can scan that. That'll take you to the, um, the, the, is it the project site or, or how to sign up for the, the weekly emails. Um, again, check out the project website, contact us with any concerns. Um, keep in mind, you know, road construction is, this is a significant project for us and there are significant impacts and we're doing everything we can to mitigate those negative impacts during construction. Um, and just keep in mind, you know, this was a very high level. There was a lot of information that I just shared with you all, but. Um, you know, the details of the specific impacts to your property are very much dependent on what the work will entail in front of your driveway or, or with your services. So with that, let's open it up to questions. Um, please keep it about construction if you can, and uh, we'll do our best to answer tonight. And if we can't answer tonight, we'll try to get back to you soon. I'm sure everybody can hear me. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, hi, Ashley Lux. I live on the corner of essentially Bain and LaFountain Street. Um, this is not a question, it's more of a, a comment. And I just want to thank uh, City of Winooski for um, the time that it probably took to implement this and the thought put into it and um, the 
patience that you have, Ryan, when you were speaking today. Um, so this is more of a thank you, commendation, and um, encouragement for the city of the residents of Winooski to just be patient with this. I definitely have seen a lot of um, these projects under underway, and then when they're finished, and when they're finished, you're like you completely forget what it looked like before, and you're like this is so beautiful. Um, so that's that's all I'm saying. Is thank you. Um, good luck. Um, and uh, let's let's look forward to 2026. Well, maybe 29 because that's when everything will be done, right? <laughs> or 32. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Um, I swear we didn't plan her to say any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to just pause the Q and A real quick. We do have a number of folks from uh, the contractor and the VHB and, and uh, GPI as well. I wanted to give an opportunity to introduce some of the team members that will help answer these questions. So I'll start with John Rauscher. Everyone, uh, John Rauscher, I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Winooski. And I'll pass it off to you. Hi everyone, my name is Evan Beecher, and I'm with the VHB, the design firm. I was the project manager throughout the design of the project. That's our role on this. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Craig Plum. I'm with GPI, and I'll be the resident project representative for this project. Next. Jeremy Sarger, I'm with Brick and Construction. Eric Baker, I'm the general superintendent for Converting Construction in this project. I'm Weldon Graziano, I'm a project engineer, he's going to be on the project full time. So, John Whitaker, I'm also with Converti, um, operations manager. I'm um, Bill Hanchett uh, with Converti, and I'm going to be the superintendent on the project. And my name is Ethan Ross Exon with Kabricki. I'll be the project manager on the project. Thanks, everyone. Um, do you want to do an online question? So we have one question from Kristen, the owner of Heavenly Nail Spa, and her question is, if construction time will turn off her water, how long and when? Because her business needs water for um, pedicures in the summer. Yeah, good question. Um, so as I noted, anybody that will have water shut off will have a minimum of 24 hour advance notice. And for businesses, we're taking an extra step and trying to understand your needs. Um, in your specific case, I would expect that the shutoff would happen at night, so you wouldn't be impacted during your normal business hours. Sorry, can you pause it here? Uh, well, it's for the online. Uh, oh, okay. Um, kind of along that same line, I, you mentioned water shutoff between spring and season and whatever and whatever. Um, I'm in River Chiropractic, um, so on um, the Tigan, just past Tigan, north, north of Tigan. So, what's the, you didn't mention a water shut up for that situation. I am like her that for us to be functioning, we need water to wash our hands, <laughs> patients. And um, so, in, in for us, in you know, this is the specific of this, you know, we can't contact people less than 24 hours. They have made appointments weeks or months in advance. So, my question what's going to happen with water shut up and also driveway access because again i have another question which i won't bombard you with but, yeah um, let me let me start with the water shut up okay um so the question was uh, a business on the northern end of the project has um basically a special need that you know in addition to needing water during normal business hours um they need to, they have appointment-based uh business that if they need to cancel folks, they need to provide more than 24 hour notice. So first of all, you know, we, we plan those shutoffs outside of your normal business hours. So you shouldn't need to make any cancellations. If for some reason that needed to change, 
we would work with you to get advance notice beyond the typical 24 hours. Um, with regard to parking and, and driveway access, um, I think I'm gonna pass that on to Ricky to answer that question, but what I would think is, um, you know, some of that work could happen at night to avoid impacts. Potentially, we'll work with you to find temporary parking so that you can still stay open even if the driveway is closed. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it to Ethan. Yeah, so I would say we'd have to take a look at your specific instance. I'm not 100% familiar with exactly which driveway it is on the north end there, but with most of the driveways for businesses along the corridor, there are wide enough that we can also phase the sidewalk work and the road work in front of it. So we could do half one time, and then once that area is ready to be reopened to traffic, we can do the other half. So there's never any impact to the ability for your patients to get in and out of your business. But it would be a case by case, and we'd have to take a look at that individual. I have a question regarding that with the overall of the project. And because I'm unclear, it mentioned that according to the schematic, uh, schematic that there would be parking on one side of the street. So from Tiger to North, is there parking? Because I know the Dr. Energy is coming in there. So is there, uh, what's the plan for parking in that area from where the parking fence is currently, is it still going to be on one side? Like right now, it's on my side of the road. Not my, the street parking. The west side of the road. But is that going away completely? Because I thought it was going away completely, the parking, but I. So the question was about street parking north of Tigan Street. And yes, in the permanent condition, it is going away completely. And I think we've talked about you know some ways of managing that. Um, during construction, I think it's it's dependent on the traffic control plan a little bit and, and the sequencing of work, which is still being flushed out. You know, the, the sewer work, it would be the first to reach that point of the corridor, and that isn't projected to take place until later in the summer, maybe early August at the soonest. So, you know, we're gonna look closely at the specific impacts of that. It may be possible for temporary parking um, during construction during the work day, it really depends. This is a good example of sort of a specific scenario that we need to look into the details and coordinate, coordinate directly with you. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do with everybody on the corridor as you know, needed. Everybody has different needs. Um, residents versus businesses are, are big difference in what each party needs. And it really just depends on the specifics of the work entailed in front of your property, so. Sorry to keep talking the whole stage here. I'll be done with this. But last question, because um, it's so. When will the parking completely go away for that area? Like I, I need a plan. Like you know, like many businesses, we have to plan for the future. And I, I don't know what this means. And when, when? Yeah. So the the, the question was when the parking configuration will be final more or less, and I think that would happen at the uh, completion of moving the curbs and um, rebuilding the road, which is projected at the end of 2025. We will certainly keep you informed as that changes potentially during construction and as it progresses. Hi, uh, Zach Parker. I'm with Twin Craft Skin Care at 2 Tigan Street. Uh, as far as the traffic closure planning, we have significant freight traffic Monday through Friday. Uh, do you foresee any additional impact for 18 wheelers coming and going through those corridors, generally off of exit 16 onto Tigan Street and then back out? We don't foresee any impacts that would prevent 18 wheelers from turning up Tigan Street. Um, you know, again, we're gonna look very closely at the specifics and the traffic control plan is intended to maintain that sort of traffic at all times. Frank Levine, BFW. I've got a question. 
uh, on the paving, it shows it's coming down to the bridge, the railroad bridge, and stops there. It does not come down all the way to the roundabout. Correct. The, it doesn't. The transition at the north side of the railroad bridge crossing is the end of the project on the south side. And I'll note too, currently that is concrete pavement that will be replaced with bituminous concrete. That was my next question. And for all you out-of-town contractors, the VFW's got the coldest beer in town. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a, another question online about parking. Um, there's a lot of parking stress throughout the city of Winooski, and they were asking if there'll be uh, temporary parking on one side of the roadway. During construction, it depends. <laughs> um, you know the the trap the the contractor scheme is set up to maintain a northbound travel lane on Main Street within their active work zones. So, you know, it seems likely that the contractor is going to make the most use of the rest of the roadway to complete as much work as possible. Um, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, depending on specifics of what they're working on, there may be times where there could be temporary parking overnight, but I do not anticipate there would be any situation where there would be temporary parking in the active work zones during the day. So again, very case by case basis, and that's something that would be included in the weekly emails if it were applicable. Um, there's another question online. We talked a lot about water outages, but is there any specifics on power outages and when those would occur and how those would impact businesses? Likely that will happen at night. And we've had some conversations with Green Mountain Power about what that entails. And typically it's, it's very brief. Um, they just need enough time to, you know, switch out the wiring for the most part. Um, but there will be more information to come on that. And uh, that's sort of the best answer I can provide right now. Hi. My name is Rago. I'm um, the owner of one of the business in um, Main Street and Gallery Street. There's like a corridor over there. So um, we are getting a lot of our power outages and water supply. Not a water supply may be a big issue, but power outage to my business would be could be a big issue because um, I have more, you know, ten, twenty, more than twenty different fridges running twenty-four by seven, and um, several of those. as well and we'll be expecting like a long um, trailer so like uh, you know, the vehicles to deliver the gas as well as other delivery um, so that will be another thing expecting a little bit of part you know um, you know traffic management there maybe that will be another thing to be part of it. Another thing um, since this project is extending to 26 and uh, we are uh, you know struggling hard to survive right now I'm not sure how hard it will be uh, to, to run our business through 2026, and we may see a, like, a huge impact on that. Uh, one way everything is like a cost-wise going up, other side, if the business, if we cannot run property, then it will be another, another hard time for us. So there will be another thing that committee can, committee should talk more in detail about that. That's my personal concern. Thank you for the question. I'll address the first two, which were uh, about power interruptions that could impact your freezers and fridges and your gas pumps. Is that more or less the concern? Um, 
your property at Bellevue Street in particular may not actually be impacted by the, the power shutoffs. Um, it, it may be served off the Bellevue Street side. Um, I, you know, I, we'd have to look into the specifics of that, but my same answer would apply that we do anticipate these to be brief shutoffs. So, you know, you wouldn't be out of power long enough to have food thaw in your freezers um, or food go bad in your fridges. I think if the electrical contractor did anticipate that the shutoff duration would be extensive, then we would have to figure out some sort of temporary power supply, be it a generator or what have you, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, the third question was about um, supporting businesses um, during the construction project. John, do you want to uh, respond to that question? Yep, so we've been working um, with John Wieski to try to look at um, how to, Brian mentioned some of that in the slides, uh, campaigns to do the, uh, we're open for business. Um, there's currently not any funding to support direct businesses as part of this project because it is just a municipal project. There's some you know, larger federal projects that, that have that sort of funding mechanism. So what we're looking to do is, is work with our local downtown Pacey group to see how we can get more foot traffic to the local businesses and make sure that we're letting people know, hey, you gotta support these local businesses. You know, contractors like to support local businesses too. We've, we've seen actually upticks on some uh, some projects where you know there's a lot of contractors that come into these uh, businesses to support them. So, um, but we will definitely work with you. Um, if, if you're not connected with downtown Winooski, um, I, we know which gas, gas stations are, so we'll we'll check with them and have them probably just stop in and chat with you a little bit about what concerns you have and how we can help you out. Yeah. We have another online question. Um, so if we're a business on Main Street, if there isn't parking available on Main Street um, in the work zone areas, where should their clients park? Um, because they're visiting during the days and not at night? Yeah, great question. And that's really going to be the million dollar question, I think, through construction. Um, where can I park if I lose my typical parking spot? Um, it's very case by case, depends on where you're located, where we would try to relocate your parking options. Um, it may be around the block on one of the side, side streets. Um, it, you know, one option, we haven't initiated the conversations with folks, but during the summer, the school parking lot may be a viable alternative for folks that aren't too far away from that location. Um, you know, the specifics of this will be relayed in the weekly updates as we sort of provide you know, if updates on impacts of traffic and parking. Um, beyond that, you know, it's tough to say exactly where folks should, should park um, because it really depends on the extent of the parking restrictions and where you're located. Their business is located between Bellevue Street and Burling Street, just for reference on Maine. Yeah, thank you. I, I think we just said it's something we have to sit down and look closely at. Um, and again, it, you know, that, that is helpful, but it depends on what the full extent of the active work zone looks like. Hello, my name is Lucas Peltier. Street. Um, my question is, what can we expect for pedestrian improvement measures? Um, because right now, um, from what I've seen, anywhere north of Spring Street, um, it's pretty dangerous for pedestrians. I see kind of people floating across the street in between, um, in between like a pedestrian crossing and one of the signals. Uh, 
So yeah, what can we expect for pedestrian improvements? Sure, so final condition, um, and again, you know, the main purpose of this project is sort of to fix that really vehicle-centric feel of the corridor and promote the multi-mode multi usage, pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so the final product will have much wider sidewalks as well as an amenity belt. Currently there's five foot sidewalks, only two foot three belt. That's gonna increase to, I think it's a six, six foot, uh, eight foot sidewalk with a five foot amenity belt. So much wider, almost double on both sides of the road. Um, there will be, you know, the, the crossings at the intersections will be retained, but there'll be fresh paint and it'll be easier to maintain that paint with the um, new pavement. And then we are adding some crossings at um, certain mid-block locations that are typically high traffic. Um, during construction, the sidewalk will be maintained at least on one side of the road for the full corridor. And where there is a uh, sidewalk shutdown, there'll be um, a crossing, temporary possibly or permanent, will be utilized um, crossing location to and signage to direct folks in the path that they need to, to go. Flashing crossers. We do have a handful of flashing beacons at the mid block crossings. Yeah. Um, just regard to the layout, and so if the sidewalks are getting that much wider and the um, green space is getting wider, where what's being taken away from the road currently? going to our timeline, but is Colchester continuing that bike lane to make it, to me it seems like it's just ending there, but I don't know what Colchester's doing, because um, you're certainly not going on the highway with the bike, <laughs> um, so, you know, you're not in an interchange, so it's, where is that going, is that connected to anything, you know? Yeah, great question. Um, the first part was how are we sort of adding with the sidewalk, with what's being taken away. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there is a cut in street parking throughout the full corridor. So that uh, eight foot parking lane on one side is being moved uh, into the sidewalks. Um, the travel lanes, I believe, are 14 feet currently. They're being reduced to 11 feet, which is more in line with the 25 mile an hour zone. Um, so we gain six feet there. So that's, I think that's the difference is the 14 feet um, from the, there's also a couple feet outside of the current sidewalk to the edge of the right of way that we're gaining. Um, that, that's the, the total sum of the difference there. The second question, where does the bike lane end? Um, I'll start to answer that and I'll pass it to Evan Dietrich because he's been more involved with the Double Diamond project, but um, we have been working closely with VTrans and this is a good example of that coordination really, I think, paying a, a dividend to the, the bike lane question, and they have incorporated an extension of a protected, uh, a buffered bike lane on the, you know, the northbound side of the road through what will be the new double diamond interchange. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure on route two and seven. I shared it, let me pass the mic to Evan. Yeah, so our project on Main Street does have bike traffic going downhill where you can go much quicker along with traffic so that'll be in the travel lane but going uphill will be a dedicated bike lane for the folks that go towards Colchester. Um, our understanding on the Divergent Diamond project is that that project has a shared use path that continues through the interchange so once you get into Colchester there'll be a connection made from our uphill bike lane or if you're coming from Colchester on the shared use path to our downhill somehow goes through the diamond interchange, but what, like, what I'm asking is at the Colchester town line, which is just beyond the diamond interchange, then what? Is it connecting to anything else? In other words, where are people going?
only with that light. Yeah, I mean, this is, it is dark with the diamond interchange, but it's not connecting the contrast to them. What's the point? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how, what, where are people going to take it on the interstate that way? So, right. The, the Shady's path continues along Route 2 and 7 through the diamond interchange. Oh, through Colchester? Yeah. Through, oh, right. Okay. So, our bike route, our bike lane, will connect to the Shady's path that goes through okay. the Virgin Country. So, they're going to have ways to get through there through Route, through route 7. Yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly what that connection detail looks like, but that is the plan. And we'll be coordinating with VTrans as we continue into the project to make sure that connection is made. I could probably add to that a little bit because I'm also the public information consultant on the on the DDI. Um, so there are only um, shoulders that go past there. So I guess when you're coming up through Winooski, there's a buffer bike lane that will continue to the actual interchange itself. Um, their cycles will actually have the option to stay on the road. Um, they actually do have some bike lane transitions on the road through the interchange. If they feel comfortable, there is also the shared use path on either side. So cyclists can choose to kind of continue through on, on the road as a bicyclist, or they can choose to kind of go off onto like a bike ramp and then go onto the shared use path. Once that gets through the interchange itself, then it goes back to a five foot um, strike shoulder. So they can continue on kind of north of, of that project. Okay, so it's not really a bike path north in the cold test, it's a shared use, which is basically a, uh, yeah, a 10 foot wide paved. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you, good question. Thanks, Evan. Hi, Paul from Tiny Tire Restaurant. Um, is that email there the best way to get in touch with the project to request modifications or amendments to the plans? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay, thanks. Uh, could you just speak to when school kind of overlaps the school uh, next year? Overlaps and how kids that walk in school will be kind of navigating this? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, are you guys, yeah, anyone speak to that level of detail on the schedule and yeah. pedestrian traffic? Yeah. So, our intent on the northern end of the project as we get up here is to do that work outside of the school hours to try to limit, or the school year, I should say, try to limit disruption to the school district here. In terms of pedestrian traffic throughout the corridor, um, we will be maintaining pedestrian traffic end to end uh, throughout the duration of the project, whether it be on one side or the other, we do have to replace the sidewalks on both sides, but it will not be happening concurrently. We'll provide uh, temporary pedestrian access routes and crossings where need be to make sure that folks can get safely across the road, especially during those hours. We might be employing uh, uniform traffic officers at those crossings to assist uh, pedestrians getting across safely, and especially up here as you get towards Norman Street and uh, the end of the project to make sure the folks can get to school safely. Thanks, Eva. Are there any other questions? And if you have questions later, please send them our way. Okay, uh, going once, twice, I think we're gonna call it, folks. Um, thank you everyone for coming out and Bearing witness, whether it was in person or online, this meeting has been recorded, so um, it is available for viewing at a later date if you'd like. And again, please sign up for the email notices and reach out with any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, what have you. Thank you.